Let me go ahead and read a little bit about the introduction. And um, Dr. Stanislav Graf um, is a uh, psychiatrist with more than 40 years of experience in research of non-ordinary states of consciousness. In the past, he was principal investigator in a psychedelic research program at the Psychiatric Research Institute in Prague in Czechoslovakia. He was chief of psychiatric research at the Maryland Psychiatric Research Center, assistant professor of psychiatry at the John Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland, and um, scholar in residency at the Esalen Institute in Big Sur, California. Currently, he's professor of psychology at the California Institute of Integral Studies in San Francisco and Pacifica Graduate School in Santa Barbara, where he conducts professional training programs in holotropic breath work and transpersonal psychology and gives lectures and seminars worldwide. He is one of the founders and chief theoreticians of transpersonal psychology and the founding president of the International Transpersonal Association. Among his um, publications are over 100 articles in professional journals in the book Realms of Human Unconscious, The Human Encounter with Death with Joan Halifax, LSE Psychotherapy, Beyond the Brain, The Adventure of Self-Discovery, Beyond Death, The Stormy Search for the Self, the last two with Christina Graf, his uh, wife. Uh, the Holotropic Mind, what do we have? Books of the Dead, the Manuals of uh, Dying and Living, The Cosmic Game, and a number of other uh, rich works that he um, has contributed to the uh, um, scientific field of uh, non-conscious um, states. And today um, he will talk to us about the psychology of the future, lessons for modern consciousness research. Dr. Graf, thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, before I start talking, I would like to thank for the invitation. I really appreciate being here, uh, particularly being here at this very important uh, um, historical moment from my perspective, uh, which is, uh, you know, return to psychedelic research. Um, there is sort of an early pilot study, I hope, beginning of uh, many studies that, uh, that will come. Uh, I would like to start in a very unconventional uh, way. Um, and if you find it too personal, just ignore me. I would get away with it in California. I don't know how things are here. <laughs> and please don't raise your hand uh, until I uh, finish the sentence. I would like to ask you, how many of you had in your own life some powerful experiences of non-ordinary states? I don't mean just uh, psychedelic. This could be something that happens in uh, spiritual practice, part of meditation, uh, participation in some uh, native uh, uh, ritual, uh, some powerful form of experiential psychotherapy, uh, uh, powerful experience in hypnosis, near-death experience, or experiences that just happen. You don't ask for it, uh, uh, you might not like it, you don't do anything for it, and it happens anyway. So any of those categories, can I ask you? Quite, quite a few people. That helps because my main focus will be on uh, uh, non-ordinary states of consciousness. Um, usually when I talk uh, for academic audiences, I start with a few biographical anecdotes because many of my colleagues have difficulties understanding how somebody with all the right credentials, you know, background in medicine, in psychology, can take something like spirituality or mysticism seriously can believe that we need something like transpersonal psychology, is giving workshops and writing books with funny, uh, somewhat flaky titles like uh, Beyond the Brain or uh, The Cosmic Game or uh, The Stormy Search for the Self. So I would like to just share something from my, from my history so that you understand how something like this can happen. Uh, first of all, I never thought I would be a psychiatrist. I would study medicine. I was much more interested in um, art. I wanted to be in animated movies. And actually, when I was finishing what uh, would be high school here, we call it gymnasium in Europe, um, I already had my interview, and I was supposed to start in the film studios in Prague. 
And just at that time, a friend of mine gave me a, a book, Introductory Lectures to Psychoanalysis by Freud. And uh, I started reading it in the evening. I got so excited I couldn't go to sleep. I read through the night. And within about uh, two days, I decided I would let the animated movies go and I would go study medicine to become a psychoanalyst. I'm sort of mentioning it before because uh, uh, what I will be talking about will take us very far beyond Freudian analysis. I want to sort of... Uh, somehow describe my initial commitment to Freudian analysis. So I joined a, a group of uh, analysts who were uh, operating in Prague and very shortly after then they had to go underground because of the communist putsch. Uh, I had seven years of uh, Freudian training which was a, a private arrangement between me and my analyst because it would have been dangerous for either of us uh, if somebody uh, knew what we were doing. Uh, I also uh, had absolutely no exposure to uh, religion. And this goes back to a um, uh, major drama in our family. My, my parents met in a small Czech town. Uh, they fell in love. They wanted to get married, but there was a problem because my father's family had no religious affiliation. My mother's family was strictly Catholic, and the local church in this small Czech town refused to marry them because my father was a pagan by their definition. And so there was a major, major problem. It seemed like it, the, the marriage would not happen at all until my grandparents found a, a brilliant solution which was, of course, a major financial donation to the church. And then uh, they relaxed their standards and decided to marry a pagan. My grandparents' dream came uh, true, which is they, they had a house on Main Street. They could roll carpets from the house across the street, stop traffic, and sort of continue up the stairs to, to the altar. So the, the guests could go from the altar right into the house. And my parents got so upset, they decided they wouldn't commit me or my brother to any religion. And we should sort of uh, um, make up our own mind when we come of age. And then from this kind of background, which means I, I was not participating in any of the uh, classes in religion that my peers were. And then from this background, I would go to medical school. That, as you know, certainly doesn't cultivate mystical awareness particularly. <laughs> and in addition, I studied medicine in Prague at the time when we had a Marxist regime. So we would get the, really the pure materialist uh, doctrine. So uh, I studied medicine. I uh, became a psychiatrist. And very, very soon I got into a deep conflict about psychoanalysis, which was the reason why I studied, studied uh, psychiatry. And this was the conflict between the, the theory and, and uh, practice of psychoanalysis. I was increasingly excited about the theory, into how many areas psychoanalysis have uh, penetrated and given seemingly brilliant interpretations for all kinds of things. Symbolism of dreams, symptomatology of neurosis, psychopathology of everyday life, uh, uh, religion, content of art, socio-political movements, and so on. So that was very exciting, but then I also became aware of what you can do with psychoanalysis as a practical clinical tool, and that was a whole other story. It was a very narrow indication range. You have to meet very special criteria. And then particularly there was the you know, enormous amount of time, energy, money. My own analysis was over seven years, three times a week, you know, tremendous commitment. And I had difficulties understanding that. I had a very Freudian... Uh, Orthodox Freudian analyst who used to say psychoanalysis is the science of the human mind. There's nothing it, psychoanalysis cannot explain in that uh, department. There are only things that it hasn't explained yet because there are not the right subjects uh, for the free associations on the couch. And uh, you had to study medicine to become an analyst. And in medicine, you know, if you really understand the problem, you usually can do something fairly dramatic about it. Or if it's an incurable disease, you have a pretty good understanding why you cannot. But here the idea was that we have complete understanding 
and yet we can do so little over such a long period of time. So I became very disappointed. I started kind of nostalgically thinking back about the animated movies. You know, I should have never chosen this uh, <laughs> discipline. Um, and then something very powerful happened in my life. Uh, this was the, uh, the time when uh, there was excitement about psychopharmacology, the early tranquilizers, antidepressants. Um, and we just finished a large study of malarial, uh, which came from Sandoz Pharmaceutical Company. So we had a good working relationship. And as you know, if you have a good relationship with pharmaceutical companies, you get a lot of fringe benefits. So <laughs> they send you free literature. Uh, they might pay your trip to a conference when you report about their uh, preparation. And they also send you a lot of uh, other preparations, you know, that they develop. So as part of this cooperation, we got a big box of uh, ampules, and there was a, an insert that came with it. It said this was LSD-25, very interesting investigational substance discovered in the laboratories of Sandus practically by accident by Dr. Hoffman. It was supposed to be a drug for relief of migraine headache and stopping gyne gynecological bleeding and, and sort of fell a little far from the tree. Uh, 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 Dr. Hoffman intoxicated himself uh, accidentally when he synthesized this uh, sample. He found out it had a very powerful psychoactive effect they reported this, gave it to Dr. Stoll, who was the, the son of uh, Dr. Hoffman's boss, the psychiatrist in Zurich. And Dr. Stoll, in 1947, published the first scientific paper on LSD in a group of uh, so-called normal volunteers and psychiatric patients. This became a sensation overnight. And Sandoz now was sending samples to different uh, research institutes, to universities, and also to individual uh, therapists. And they were basically asking, you know, would you work with the substance and let us know if there was any legitimate use uh, for, uh, for LSD. And uh, in the letter, they suggested two possibilities. One was uh, we have a feeling on the basis of the pilot study that um, this uh, drug produces in minuscule dosages of millions of a gram, uh, a state that's very similar to naturally occurring psychosis. So it's possible that psychiatrists, psychologists would have a model here. You could give it to normal people, do all kinds of testing before, during, and after, get some insight about what's happening in the body when these changes in the mind are uh, occurring. and. Uh, it could turn out that schizophrenia and other psychosis would really be chemical problems. They would not be psychiatric problems at all. Uh, the excitement about LSD was not the effect because uh, the, uh, uh, there was already a knowledge of the psychedelic effects of mescaline. Mescaline was studied in the, in the 30s. But the excitement was about the minuscule dosage because it was conceivable that the human body could produce under certain circumstances, small quantities of a similar substance and um, um, be responsible for psychotic phenomena. And the idea was if we can identify the substance, we can find some neutralizing agent and there would be a test tube kind of a solution. Uh, then there was a second point which became uh, something that changed my life. And that was a little note that said, we also feel that maybe this substance could be used as a kind of unconventional training tool for psychiatrists and psychologists and uh, students and nurses. Um, professionals would have the opportunity to spend a few hours in the world of their patients and as a result of it be able to communicate with them better, to understand them better and hopefully to be more effective in their treatment. So. Uh, this was an opportunity I wouldn't have missed for anything in the world. I became one of the early volunteers. And my uh, preceptor who got the substance from uh, Sandoz at the time was interested in EEG. And he was also interested at the time in what's called driving the brain waves, exposing people to different acoustic and optical frequencies and studying in the corresponding areas of the brain if uh, entrainment happens, if the brain waves will pick up the frequency that is being fed. 
So uh, those of us who wanted the LSD experience had to agree to have not only the EEG done, but also our brainwaves driven sort of before, during, and after.